Let's do an overview of SD-WAN and see what benefits you get from software-defined WAN. Stay tuned. Hey guys, Mike here from Fortinet Guru. You guys all know me. You know I love outside zone, inside zone. I throw my WAN interfaces in the outside zone and I let it ride. I usually use some manual type of health check that I configure myself that has no real SLA tied to it. And I also usually use policy routes if I want traffic to go over a link that I consider more desirable for that traffic type. Now obviously that's an incredible manual way of doing it. Well, Mikey has gotten another internet provider installed at his home office. So I'm gonna dive in and do a high level overview of how I have SD-WAN configured at my house, use cases that make sense to everybody else, and what we can do to help make life better with that. People have made comments that they wish to see more on-screen tutorials, which is absolutely understandable. That's what we're gonna do in this video. I have here my FortiGate, my home FortiGate, my FortiGate ADE PoE. God, I almost forgot my own model. Anyways, I have it running 6.4.1. Don't run it in production but I'm running it at my house because it's a house unit and it only has three people it has to support, though it does have about 60 devices on that network. But anyways, like I said, I have dual internet at the house now. I have a one gig symmetrical fiber line and then I have a one gig down, 50 meg up, come on cable, catch up. Fiber can't be beating you that bad, right? Anyways, have that set up for a backup link. Reason why I did this, fiber is incredibly reliable. At least it has been for me but I do live in a new construction neighborhood and the fiber has gone out at times. So due to the fact that I work from home a great deal, my wife does as well and my kids have to do their schooling from home, I decided I need some high availability configuration from an internet perspective. That way if one dies, the other one picks up the load. So a couple of things about my particular setup. One, I have those two gigabit lines. They're not equal though. The fiber has lower jitter, the fiber has a faster latency, and it's just a better circuit, not to mention it's one gig symmetrical. The cable modem though has a gig down, 50 meg up, and it certainly does whatever I need it to. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna dive into my FortiGate ADE PoE, which is my home unit, and I'm gonna make sure to block my IP addresses so you guys don't start harassing me, but it is what it is. So I'm gonna log in to my unit here. And as you can see, Pruitt HQ, that is my house. I have dual internet links, I'm running SD-WAN, it's running 641 in all of its glory and all of its limitations, but that is what it is, right? So we're sitting here and as you can see, I have my AT&T fiber through Uverse and it's just got its links and it's, it's pushing anywhere between zero and 50 megabits depending on what we're streaming. And then of course I have my cable modem that is serving a very specific function for this video. If you actually look at the SD-WAN monitor, you can see both links are up, the number of sessions that are going across each link, the amount of upload and download that each one is using. So if we jump into network, and instead of going to interfaces, we're gonna look at SD-WAN zones. Both of these connections are DHCP, which means I do not have static IPs. The benefit of the fiber line is that the IP is actually tied to the physical port I'm plugged into at the tap. So as long as my fiber doesn't get cut and I stay in that port, I'm good. So if you look here, you guys know I love zones. I love them. It is. It's amazing. Great organization. I hated SD-WAN in 6.2 because you had a single SD-WAN interface. You threw all your interfaces in there, which means if you had WAN interfaces and IPsec interfaces, they were all in the same group. It was ugly. It was gnarly. I didn't like it. 6.4 brings on the ability to have SD-WAN zones, which means that you could actually group SD-WAN members into specific zones and use those for policies and routes. And what that means is you can have multiple IPsec interfaces that give you the ability to have its own SD-WAN for the IPsec tunnels. So traffic that's meant for IPsec can go over those links. You can have SD-WAN interfaces or zones specifically for your internet connectivity, et cetera, et cetera. Now, why do we want SD-WAN? Well, SD-WAN gives you the ability to do things with less expensive direct internet access circuits, IPsec tunnels, and things like that, that you would normally have to buy higher quality private lines like MPLS circuits, T1s, direct point-to-points, et cetera. 
Internet's getting faster, internet's getting cheaper, the quality of internet is also getting better. Latency and jitter is improving, especially as we have more fiber providers, so it just makes sense to use less expensive links to provide the SD-WAN functionality that you need. So we're sitting here, right? As you can see, I have an outside zone. I created an outside zone and I threw each one of my connections in it. So it's simple, my outside zone, the internet, the outside. So we threw it in there, AT&T fiber, cable modem. Now if we double click this, you can see they're just members. To, or if you wanted to add an SD-WAN member, you just go to create new SD-WAN member, you choose the link. For instance, mine used to have you know, WAN 1 and cable modem listed here, but of course they're, they're SD members already, so they're not there anymore. If I were to add another link and hung it off WAN 2, I would just click this, say what its gateway is, assign it to the appropriate zone, be on my way. But anyways, so step one, create your SD WAN zone. Cool. Step two, create your SD WAN members with the links that you wish to be a member of that zone. If you have a whole bunch of IPsec tunnels, they're gonna load internal private networks, add each one of those as an SD-WAN interface separately, assign them to an SD-WAN zone, boom, you're good to go. You can set your SLAs and things of that nature. So I have my SD-WAN zone, mine is incredibly simple. I have my outside zone that has my two internet connections in them. Next, I decided to define SD-WAN rules. SD-WAN rules are what you use to define what traffic goes over which link. Very, very simple. They are basically policy routes. Really, that's pretty much what they are. Highly configurable policy routes, but policy routes nonetheless. As you can see here, my top rule is Pruitt Primary. My last name is Pruitt. I call my network the Pruitt LAN. I'm not very creative. Oh well. Pruitt LAN of 10.100.100.0 slash 24. If you are on the Pruitt LAN, I want your primary member to be the fiber. Now, if the fiber link were to fail, this route, this policy would not be used. It would use the link that's still existing. My Internet of Things out policy, which is my IoT network. I know, shocking, very simple. Very, very creative, right? Anyways, my IoT network going to any destination, use the cable modem as its preferred interface. And that's the number of hits for that. And then, of course, guest out. I have a third SSID that hangs off my Ubiquity Unify APs. Ubiquity? I think I said that right. I always butcher that name. Southern Draw messes it up anyways. But as you can see, I have guest Wi-Fi and it's told to go out the cable modem as well. Now your policies can be fairly granular. You can come in here, name your policy whatever you want. If you have Fortinet single sign-on or LDAP integration, you can actually define user groups. So maybe you have a whole bunch of people you don't like. Send them out the crappy link, man. It is what it is. It's your network, right? So you can define your source address, your source user group. More importantly, you can actually assign destination addresses, internet services, or applications, which gives you the ability to say, if you're going to this destination, go over this link. If you're going to this internet service, go over this link. If you're using this application, you should use this specific link. And then, of course, you can choose your outgoing interfaces via... Uh, a plethora of strategies. The, the four main ones are manual, which means you just assign the outgoing interface, best quality, lowest cost, or maximum bandwidth. All of these have a short little, you know, description explaining exactly what they are. <clears throat> All of mine are currently using interface preferences because that's the way I like to do it. And then of course you can set SLAs. And then you click OK and your, your policy is built. Mine are fairly simple. I do not do anything by application right now. Next, you have your performance SLAs. This is how you rate your link quality. This is how you assign quality to your link. This is how you assign preference to your link. This is how you say this link is better than the other one. It is, it's very simple. And there's three major criteria. If you go in here, I have one called Google. It's quad eight, it's as simple as it comes. Is this 100% reliable? No, I recommend having multiple DNS servers in there specifically so if one goes down, you at least have a higher quality list, right? But for my purposes, this works. And you know, it's my house, I only care about what works for me. So what we have here is I'm using a DNS protocol from my SLA. I'm specifying the server as quad eight because that's what I care about. I want to use Google. They use multicast, anycast, all kinds of cast, whatever it is. 
it's broadcast everywhere. It's relatively reliable, right? If this was a production environment for an enterprise, I would probably say bump this puppy up and use a couple more just to be safe. But you can use ping, HTTP, and DNS. DNS has been fairly reliable for me. My SLA target, these are the three things that I'm able to set my SLA on. Latency threshold. If a link goes above 25 milliseconds for its communication to quad eight, it's considered degraded. If my jitter threshold goes over five milliseconds, you got it, it's considered degraded. If my packet loss threshold goes above zero, that link is definitely degraded. Both of these links are actually really good from a packet loss perspective. Haven't had any issues. If you have lower cost links or maybe you have cable modem service that's not as quality, you might want to bump this up. Adjust this to meet your needs. And then of course you can check the interval. I have mine check every 500 milliseconds and if it fails five times in a row, it will pull the route just like a standard health monitor that we used to do back on uh, the manual way of doing things, right guys? Link monitors work. This is a more granular level of link monitor. And then of course you can restore the link as well after X number of successes. I use five for failure, five for successes. If it jumps up in packet loss or jitter or latency for one out of five times, it's not gonna be a big deal for me. And then of course I have it told to update the static route. Link is good, have the static route installed. Link is bad, pull the static route. So both of my links go through that SLA. And as you can see, both of them are 0% packet loss. Both of them have really, really close latency. I'm actually impressed with the cable modem in this regard. It's only about a millisecond higher. Jitter is about a millisecond and a half higher. That usually is actually a bigger spread. It's usually around two to three. But as you can see, that fiber line steady, man. It stays the course it is. It's so reliable. Cable modem, more flexibility, more fluctuation. It's a cable modem, what do you expect? But it works, right? So, major benefit of 641 as far as SD-WAN is confirmed concerned is the fact that they have added SD-WAN specific events to the log monitor. So if you jump into the log report, you go to events, one of the drop downs over here in the top right is SD-WAN events. Now what this will do is it makes it infinitely easier for you to know what's going on with your links. Why did my interface remove itself from the WAN load? Why did the interface show down? Why, are, why is my packet loss seeming high? Et cetera. You know, you have all that stuff. Oh look, the link is outside of the SLA. Well, which link is that? So you're diving in here, you're actually able to look at SD-WAN events that are related to your device. It makes troubleshooting a lot easier. As you can see, you can look and see, oh, number of past member changed. You know, it's, it's passing SLA. Oh, member in SLA is failing for some reason. And you can actually scroll down and it's just giving you in this case, the, the links are fairly quality, so you don't actually see a whole lot. When one jumps out of SLA, it tells you. And then from there, you can actually do deeper digging and see what's going on with it, right? Um, I do all my logging local to the device. It does have some FortiCloud logging built in, but I don't use it. This is a home unit. It doesn't even have FortiGuard or UTM on it, but it does what I need. So there you have it guys, SD-WAN in the most simplest of deployments, right? We want to start simple. I wanted to start simple. I didn't want my internet connection acting wonky while I'm trying to upload videos or play video games. Because Lord knows playing Call of Duty Warzone, last thing I need is high pings or IPs jumping. But that's how I have my SD-WAN configured. I am brand new to 641. I literally installed 641 when I knew I was getting my secondary line because I liked some of the things they were bringing from an SD-WAN feature set. I avoid 6.2, I hate 6.2. I'm never ever gonna deploy a client to that. I guess that's a lie I already have. I've had clients deploy themselves to that. But 6.4 so far has been fairly stable. I do not recommend it from a production environment, but if, you're, if you have a home unit or a lab unit and you're wanting to try out SD-WAN and you actually want the flexibility to do SD-WAN the way it's actually intended to be done, please by all means jump on. And remember, SD-WAN sole purpose is to let you use software to define how your packets flow across your network, what links do they use, so that you can use less expensive, 
more direct links or consumer level links. You no longer have to use private lines, MPLS, point to points, all those expensive things that cost like $1,000 for a 10 meg line because you're pretty much set up, right? Dive in with your, you know, I have $160 a month worth of internet because both of the lines cost roughly 80 bucks a pop. It's a shame Doxus 3.1 isn't pushing higher uploads as far as a symmetrical thing, but it is what it is. Hey guys, if you like this video and you found it helpful, do me a favor, hit the like button, share it around, tell your friends, post it wherever. If you didn't like it, hit the thumbs down. Screw it, man. I just want people to interact so they can actually help me pick the content that you guys find useful. If this is your first video that you've ever seen by me, do me a favor, hit the subscribe button and notify bell. That way you can stay up to date. If you liked the video, of course. If you didn't like it, just go away. Do your thing. But um, hopefully this video was helpful. Like it, subscribe, notify it. Stay tuned for more videos as we jump in and do what's necessary to help educate the masses on Fortinet gear. And also, maybe if you watch some of my rants, educate Fortinet on where they're messing up. But anyways, until next time, guys, stay safe. And, uh, you know, don't catch the Ronas. And if you do, beat it. I don't know. I think I'm getting a little cabin feverish from not leaving the house, but oh well. So you guys stay tuned. See you next time.